Hey, Mike, thanks so much for joining me today. And I heard through the grapevine that you had some thoughts on purple teaming and how vendors interact with purple teaming. Hey, Zia, thanks for having me on. Um, when I heard that you were looking into purple teaming, I got really excited because I'm very excited about all things purple team. Um, these are my thoughts. Um, I am employed by a, a security vendor in the space specifically for email, but uh, my experience with Purple Team is kind of an amalgamation of working at a couple of different private places in the defense sector, um, as well as a number of different security vendors. And I am always really excited to talk to anybody who's interested in Purple Team. So looking forward to talking about it today. Yes, thank you so much. And like you said, brief disclaimer, we are not speaking on behalf of our employers. We're here in our individual capacity. Um, and there will be a huge legal disclaimer at the bottom of the video as well and in the appendix of my dissertation. So um, hopefully um, all the legal bases will be covered. Yeah, so, and it's more exciting because we have really cool thoughts that we're not paid to have. So that's how you know it's the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what are your thoughts on purple teaming and purple team tools? So uh, let me get my video going. Perfect. So yeah, so purple team, I feel like can be a really broad definition, which is really cool. Um, as long as it's kind of perfectly scoped within what you're trying to accomplish in your organization. I think it's always helpful to start at least how I'm attempting to uh, characterize it and talk. Um, in my particular case, I'm attempting to characterize purple as a collaboration exercise between uh, a number of different infosec uh, groups within an enterprise organization with the ultimate goal being establishing, testing, securing, and um, ultimately improving upon existing security controls. Um, and there's been a lot of really cool frameworks established historically to talk about how to go about doing that. Uh, one of the favorite ones that I've seen so far is the Atomic Purple Team uh, framework that is available publicly, um, but it, it does a really good job of establishing uh, kind of a, a cycle for uh, the Purple Team process that mimics the intelligence cycle, um, starting with kind of like assessment, uh, planning, the scope of the engagement, um, the actual red teaming, the attack portion, the blue teaming, defend portion, uh, and then ultimately the hardening and uh, reporting phase, which I think is really, really, really important. Um, so that framework, I'm going to kind of use that as like an armature to talk about some of the ideas that I have, because smarter people already did the work to come up with that. Um, I oh, think it's yeah. important I within the context. Sorry, really. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so yeah, I looked at the Atomic Purple Team framework, and they did such an amazing job. Um, for simplicity's sake, I guess, I ended up using um, size, uh, Purple Team exercise framework, and they had four pillars. So, um, you know, and I use that as my conceptual framework for all of my dissertation questions. So it'll be really interesting to get your take on Atomic Purple Team and their framework so that we can have additional perspectives on Purple Teaming for Purple Team professionals. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, definitely there are a lot of resources and a lot of really good ones. Um, I kind of gravitated towards Atomic Purple Team because they do a really good job of breaking down within the Purple Team process how the different security organizations relate to each other at different phases of this process. So um, it kind of detailed the uh, Purple Team as red team, blue team, and uh, managerial risk assessment teams, which are super important. Um, I like to think of it in a little bit of a different context, extending the blue team to include also security vendors that are responsible for appliances in the stack, um, which I know some people are going to object to just kind of traditionally, but I think it's a really important thing to make sure that uh, teams that are included in the blue team environment are also kind of a, a communicating part of that purple team engagement environment. Oh, hey, Mike. Also, um, in case the listeners are curious, uh, there is a link to the Atomic Purple Team and what you are talking about on the GitHub for Enterprise Purple Teaming, or you can just Google it. It's by Defensive Origins, just FYI. 
Awesome. Yeah, I saw that page and I was impressed. That is an incredible resource for everything Purple Team Enterprise. I feel like I need to go back and read it more fastidiously so I can learn something. Um, oh, but, but thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I think from uh, a Purple Team perspective within an enterprise, it's helpful to keep in mind how not only the processes are going for blue team and red team, but also how management and risk management might be perceiving uh, the purple team process. So I think purple team is kind of perceived as an investment within an enterprise. It costs a lot of money and a lot of cycle by a lot of different disciplined teams to kind of produce uh, something worthwhile. Um, and considering it in context of a return on investment, um, I think the purple team cycle uh, is an investment in human capital and tooling in order to reduce risk uh, with the improvements to the security appliances and posture being that return on investment. So by reducing risk, you're actually giving a possibly monetizable return on investment for the management team that has kind of gone through the process. Oh, hey, Mike, and believe it or not, so far, um, you know, I haven't gone through all of the analysis phase, but a lot of the interviews that I've been having, they have just consistently stated that uh, ROI is very, very important, one of the driving factors for purple teaming. So I just wanted to add that, that it is so important. And thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, totally. I think that's why another reason I uh, kind of gravitated towards Atomic Purple Team is they include uh, this kind of built into the process. They actually have the final phase of this process being report, um, which seems kind of obvious when you write it down, like you need to report your findings. But I think it's it's kind of nicer to put a sharper point on that as uh, it's not just reporting, it's actually justifying existence and demonstrating return on investment. Um, and over time, uh, I know a lot has been said and a lot has been written about techniques, the kind of sexy part of purple team, which is red team, blue team, kind of squaring off in a defensive and offensive environment. I actually think that most purple team engagements may succeed or fail in both the planning stage and in the reporting stage. So both in scoping and then finally in demonstrating the scope of the attack that, uh, sorry, the engagement that you're attempting to carry out. Oh yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And I think too, um, uh, companies can very much benefit at looking at their defensive and depth uh, structure, their control stack essentially. Um, and looking at that from a purple perspective. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that is kind of what the planning phase is for. It's figuring out what you want to do in a purple team engagement. Um, I think in that stage, there's a pitfall on kind of both ends of the spectrum. I think that if you're very specific in what you're looking to test, um, if you're interested in basically testing a security appliance for efficiency, or if you're interested in testing your defense in depth uh, in a more dynamic engagement, I think both can be successful if it's somewhere in the middle, but I think you can fail by scoping both too narrowly as well as much too broadly. So like as an example, if you were trying to uh, test a very simple security control, something like um, we want to test this type of attachment against our security email stack and determine whether or not that is going to be uh, dropped by policy because we heard it's being used in ransomware attacks. So you go and throw that file type, let's say it's a .t or whatever at your stack and it's discarded and you go back to management and say, success, we've gone ahead and demonstrated that we're protected against ransomware specifically because we dropped .t's. I think you've deprived yourself of the ability to offer a return on investment because A, there's a lot more intelligence out there on how ransomware is deployed. And B, I think just by confirming a pre-existing bias towards your security stack, you're not adding value. You're kind of narrowly scoping uh, your, your stack in a way, your test in a way that limits your stack improving and your security posture improving. Yeah. Um, oh. Uh, really quick, Mike, I just want to say yes, totally. Um, a lot of the respondents, they said having flexibility uh, with the purple team engagements, whether that's a full scope, a full kill chain adversary emulation or uh, TTP testing and just understanding quote unquote best effort. 
Like it's not um, like the executives misinterpreting it and being like, oh, we're fine. And just ensuring that they communicate that, you know, well, that may be fine, but there's a lot of nuance to it. So I totally agree and think that that's a very important aspect to it. Yeah, that warm and fuzzy can be a, a good thing to get people off of your back and get buy-in, but it could also be a missed opportunity sometimes too. And I definitely want to return to the point of uh, communication and purple teaming in general, but um, that kind of full-scale, full kill chain adversary emulation that you're talking about, I think at the other end of the spectrum can have just as bad of a pitfall. Like if you're giving kind of carte blanche to simulate a fairly sophisticated adversary, or a very sophisticated adversary and scoping it to a specific security appliance in your, your stack, like a, an RDP uh, agent or something like that. Um, and then you're like, once you get on host, go ahead and move laterally all that you're capable of and write a report on it. I think it's important in the scoping phase to understand what tools may be utilized by Red Team when they're in a environment and making sure that you have the tools to track their movement through your environment. So. Like let's say they succeed in exploiting RDP and they're using kind of well-known post-exploit frameworks like Cobalt Strike or uh, PowerShell Empire, and they're laterally moving all over the network, pulling down different shares, accessing different work groups. Um, and it's very exciting for them, but uh, you learn on the blue team side during the report phase that you only PowerShell log for two weeks and it all ended up getting purged and you can't trace it from your visibility of what that detection would look like to improve upon it, you have no opportunity for return on investment because you're not adjusting your security controls to respond to that internal threat. You've only identified a gap. So figuring out if a, in the scope phase, in the planning phase, if you're looking to identify gaps or uh, find actionable improvements or step number five in Atomic uh, Purple Team is harden or adjust your environment. So making sure that whatever your red team resources are, that you're able to report on them and track them accurately to make sure you're collecting on ROI, I think it's also a pretty big deal. So usually somewhere in the middle is the right answer. Don't go too extreme and don't just confirm a hypothesis in the middle is what I've experienced, at least trying to track it on the back end. That, that is so true. And thank you so much for stating the importance of that. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of fun stories about like when someone pops a shell in a like red team engagement as part of a purple team process and you're kind of relying on their best summary of what happened, which is kind of like describing a kickflip that you performed. It's always like really intense and really cool, but unless you can like go back to the GoPro footage, you're not exactly what, sure what you looked like while it was happening. So maybe not as cool as when described. Um, but yeah, I think um, that's a really important part on the planning side. And then to return to the uh, reporting phase, the final phase where you demonstrate return on investment, I think communication, which you already mentioned is really, really important. Um, I think that it needs to be built in as a prerequisite to any successful purple team engagement. Um, specifically because um, when you're dealing with multiple teams in your environment, and by my definition, I like to include vendors as an, ex like an extension to the blue team environment. I'm not saying tell your vendors when you're going to test their products. I'm not saying give them a heads up, it's coming. I'm just saying when you configure your appliance, it's helpful to have a channel to communicate with your vendor so that you can deconflict threat activity from red team activity. Um, a lot of the time, uh, enterprise vendor defenders, not blue teamers on your enterprise, are mostly communicating with your blue team employees because they handle the appliances, they deal with the threats. You're not usually giving your blue teamers a heads up that a red team engagement is coming. So uh, a lot of the time you'll send an email or a chat or pick up the phone, say, hey, we're seeing some pretty intense stuff. We think it's red team. They'll be like, no, that's not red team. We don't know about it. Well, of course you don't know about it. It's red team activity. So having a, a pre-established channel to deconflict activity, uh, both with your vendors and more of a external communique, but also internally within your team. So you want your blue team to be able to communicate with risk management, uh, to be able to then verify that, yeah, that might be a red team engagement. Here are the IOCs. We don't wanna go ahead and do a full incident response and escalation in response to that. Um, and making sure that those are very well-worn channels of communication. 
uh, can make sure that not only uh, you're documenting what's going on and that you can report it at the end, but can save some late night phone calls to people who might be on vacation or whatnot. Yes, because um, there are there are certain enterprise vendors, I won't name names, uh, but some of them are really, really good and they are on top of it. And they will email you and your manager and your manager's manager, whoever they need to email the CISO um, to let you know of certain activities. So um, really looping in uh, your vendor sometimes uh, can definitely be, It'd be a good idea, especially with what Mike just said, you know, just stating the importance of it. They they see this stuff. They actually pay attention. Um, and the really, really good ones will go above and beyond to make sure that your company is protected and aware of this type of activity. So um, definitely uh, getting that hashed out beforehand so you're not working on a Sunday, you know, and then you find out, oh, it's red team. Oh, okay, well, well. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of that. And thank you so much, Mike, for sharing that because it, yeah. is, it is a big deal. It is a big issue and it does happen. Yeah, in my experience, the good vendors, most vendors, are willing to have a conversation about how to treat that sort of activity uh, because it's important. So threats are threats, but from a technology perspective, security vendor appliances are designed to detect threats, not simulated threats, not actual threats, threats full stop. So understanding technologically that threats are going to be treated in an agnostic fashion and disposed of in an agnostic fashion is very important. So the expectation that um, vendors are capable of identifying red team activity is an extra layer that good ones do, but then understanding what they do with it. You gotta know if a vendor is going to communicate it and say, hey, this is something you should be concerned with. We think it's red team, but we're not sure. We don't wanna let it slide. They could just track it and be like, oh, that's red team. Let's write a signature. We don't want to destroy it on their behalf because that's an investment that the organization has made. That's money spent. So if we're just burying that and not going ahead and reporting it, it might be a like broken link in your chain for reporting and demonstrating return on investment. And further than that, we might just have a kill it with fire approach. Um, and when I say we, it's the royal we, not any employer that I have currently, but um, it's they might just go ahead and be like, it's a threat. We're gonna block it because our technology says it's a threat. So having that conversation beforehand to understand what your desired posture is for red team as a customer, and also how your vendors are treating it at different stages in your stack is very helpful for being able to do a die test for where, uh, D-Y-E, not D-I-E, uh, for where your particular purple team might be getting uh, disrupted or halted within the context of your purple team engagement. Yeah, this is this is extremely important. So let's say you pay a third party vendor to come in and do purple teaming for your org and you pay a lot of money or let's say you're in the UK as an example and you're regulated, you're heavy, heavily regulated or even in the United States, you're heavily regulated, right? And so they're paying these consulting firms to come in and run these ops. And, you know, some of them have to be run a certain way. So if they're getting caught, you know, by a vendor's product or whatever it is, like um, maybe giving them a heads up ahead of time or having uh, measures in place to be like, oh, well, you know, our initial entry, you know, using XYZ thing uh, got caught. So uh, I guess I guess it's assumed breach time, you know. And so just having that set up and planned ahead of time, um, I think can be helpful or potentially working with your uh, vendors that could potentially block those type of exercises. Because like Mike said, they're expensive. So you want to get value out of it. And whether it's an external consulting firm or your internal red team, they're both expensive. <laughs> like they both take time and energy and effort and resources and all of that to, to conduct. So and that line of communication could be super fruitful. It can be, I mean, this is the vendor pitch side, like, oh, demonstrate how worth the money you spend on us is. That is a 
return on investment that gives the warm and fuzzy up the chain. Uh, it doesn't give a chance to improve, but the other half of the coin is if it gets through, you can communicate that. You could say, hey, let's do something on your end, vendor, to go ahead and make sure that we are stopping these threats so that we're getting more value for the money we're paying on you. Um, I'm not gonna go and say that I said that. Uh, that's a non-attributable statement to somebody else who's very smart in this field maybe. Um, but uh, that's the sort of thing that you can get the most for your money out of the very expensive appliances that you have. And if the analyst team is good, which they usually are, they like seeing new threats. They like to make sure that they're making customers happy for the types of innovative threats that are being tested. Um, and you can then put that in your ROI report. We drove change within our vendor tooling to make sure that we're better protected against this threat further up the kill chain in the delivery cycle. Yeah, and uh, you know there may or may not be someone on this call that happens to like uh, digging into new threats. So, and likes uh, looking at those techniques and technologies and all of that stuff involved with um, with uh, security, cybersecurity. So. Not going to name names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, anything new, anything innovative, it's an opportunity for the vendor as well to become a leader in the space. So if you're afraid you're making noise, which let's be honest, nobody's afraid they're making noise. Everybody feels like they're not getting enough for what they're paying. So fully, fully uh, in support of opening a line of communication, both for deconfliction as well as for sharing novel threats uh, to better improve the posture in your organization. And that is in and of itself, uh, an adjustment and an improvement uh, and a return on investment for the, uh, the purple team exercise that you're working in. Yes, totally agree. Yeah, I mean, I know in my experience, um, it's kind of interesting to think of the current landscape regarding red team aspects of purple team. So I talked kind of about the blue team being an extension of uh, I'm sorry, vendors being an extension of the blue team environment. And my experience has historically been pretty much purely uh, blue team. But in that blue team experience, I've seen pretty interesting and rigid uh, dynamics within the red teaming uh, landscape that are seen in a pretty large enterprise vendor environment. Um, and depending on the type of red team threat that is being perceived, it can also sort of uh, affect the response and actioning of the identification of such threats. So um, I've kind of seen it break down along three lines. Um, the first uh, line is kind of a, a security control testing uh, category of red team type threats. So I would just find that as a kind of automated attempt to test a technological control that doesn't really take into account the human factor. It's not using social engineering. Um, and its goal is really to confirm the effectiveness and efficacy of a certain type of threat. Um, this could be testing attachment types against an email portal. This could be detonating certain types of scripting files against an endpoint uh, agent, or it could be throwing certain traffic at a firewall or a particular network appliance to make sure that it's being discarded. Um, it's usually fairly easy to identify in an automated, uh, as automated activity from a defender standpoint. And uh, it's usually not very dynamic in its attempt. Um, you'll see a lot of it. You'll see um, same file names, testing names, and this is the sort of thing that I think can be carried out by both a blue team or a red team. Um, it's activity that kind of seems like it can be a blue team appliance configuration or just a, a kind of run of the mill. Uh, I always refer to a kind of a defense contractor sort of engagement uh, coming out of the defense sector originally. It's the type of uh, engagement that just goes down the list, test this file type against this thing, and then it's a checklist of whether or not it was successful, which is a perfectly legitimate uh, effort and often does not require uh, a large overhead regarding human capital to perform that sort of uh, engagement. Um, I like that one, they're pretty easy to block and I don't feel the need to notify on it a lot of the time because it's very easy to identify that sort of thing as a test in and of itself. The second category, uh, sorry, go ahead, Zina, I don't mean to. Oh, off. no, no, that's okay. I was just gonna um, state that 
you know, it seems like uh, from some of the research that I've done uh, so far, you know, not, uh, you know, don't don't take this as like the end all be all for my dissertation, but just having conversations with people, it seems like purple teaming is uh, like they're attempting to move beyond checkbox security um, and also bring in like creativity and innovation on like a, basically a daily basis or continuous basis, whether it's a quarterly pur purple team report or even uh, control testing, continuous purple teaming. So, um, you know, that there is, there is that aspect of it where it's more checkbox, but I think it's really interesting how security professionals as a, as a whole, um, like the actual practitioners are um, interested in non checkbox security, um, like, you know, being creative and innovative. So yeah, it's, it's funny. So that's actually the second category I was going to attempt to talk about, which has really exploded in the last two to three years, um, which I would describe as emulation frameworks. So what kind of started as a checkbox movement, like I just described, still happens, but um, there's been a big, big spike in emulation frameworks being utilized. Um, things oh, that are- oh, Sorry, and and I wanna say there's nothing wrong with, with you know, doing the checkbox, because sometimes that's all people can do. And like, if that's all that you can do, like, that's great. That's better than nothing. So just in case people are listening that are like, oh no, we do that. Or, you know, oh no, <laughs> just yeah. like, you know. I'm, I'm fully in support of testing every appliance that way when you're configuring it for the first time to know what you can expect from it. I totally, totally agree that that should be a baseline practice um, that can be defined in Purple Team or externally to Purple Team as part of uh, blue team security control configuration or how you want to track that. Um, I think it's probably an essential practice. Um, that's definitely my defender bias coming out being like, ah, whatever. Yeah, my, mine definitely too. Um, so thank you. Sorry for interjecting that. No, no, not at all. It's an important point. Um, yeah, it's very easy to get complacent um, because I haven't been in an enterprise in a while. So um, the other part that I'm seeing from the landscape is like I was saying, emulation framework. So, that's going to be tools um, that are usually in a scripted manner. Uh, sometimes it can be hybridized with either the checkbox security testing, uh, security control testing like we described, or a fully uh, human operated team uh, to simulate sophisticated adversaries in an environment, usually uh, through a uh, automated kit. So whether that's going to be emulating TTPs once you're on a network, uh, whether that is going to be deploying specific tools uh, in a benign fashion that otherwise would be malicious in combination with malicious payloads. Um, and then there is a third, within the second example, a third way I'm seeing emulation testing rise that's concerning to me. Um, I think it's a legitimate practice, but can be problematic if not deployed the right way. Um, I'm seeing actually malicious binaries or actor binaries that are written about in open source or publicized in white papers or dropped on VT being kind of collected and worked into emulation frameworks and deployed against enterprise environments, which I usually would assume in best practices should be testing environments. So in and of itself, that emulation practice is not harmful. Um, especially if the uh, emulation framework is taking the time to hollow out the payloads, basically changing the C2s to benign uh, IP addresses or domains and changing the functionality to a more benign functionality or at least understanding the full scope of that functionality. Um, I can say that there is instances where that's not the case, where there are live payloads being utilized from APT groups and just being thrown at enterprises by emulation frameworks. So. If you're in an enterprise environment, and this is, I mean, take it for what it's worth. I am not an authority on this. I'm just a guy. But um, if it was my enterprise environment, I would definitely take the time to make sure that the payloads have been hollowed out, that the testing environment is very isolated and independent within my environment, and that it, if it does relate uh, or result in a live C2 callout, that uh, I'm not using corporate IP space for my testing environment. Um, because if you're using like a live APT payload, that's going to be communicating with actor infrastructure. So whether or not you're intending to give information about your testing environment, you are. It's a testing environment, not the end of the world, but it's still giving 
Um, usually actors that are very concerned about who's communicating with their C2s, a lot of confusing activity to sort through and might draw attention that is otherwise undesired. And further, it's driving change within the uh, threat actor landscape. They're becoming aware that their tools are being tested against and they're gonna further innovate. So what you're testing today is going to drive them to be something different tomorrow and you're driving down the value of your testing. Um, so in the long run for emulation frameworks, definitely a big fan of using uh, hollowed out payloads in that regard. There's a lot of really competent and incredible vendors that do that. Um, and then even at another level, there's uh, vendors uh, that combine emulation frameworks of TTPs with manned operations to do uh, dynamic pen tests against your environment. Um, so simulating sophisticated APT type breaches uh, with their tactics, but instead of getting a call out to the C2 server, you're gonna get a time check and then they're gonna try and open uh, notepad.txt. So um, it's helpful to, to understand some of the downfalls of emulation frameworks if not deployed in a kind of enterprise safe manner. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, um, that is very important. And I think some of the participants that I spoke with, they emphasized definitely the importance of understanding what it is that you're dealing with. Uh, just like Mike said, like really understand, you know, the payloads and what it's doing and what you expect to happen within your environment. And that goes back to the planning phase as well and the scoping phase. Um, this is part of it as well. And um, definitely OPSEC. Um, I totally agree. OPSEC is important. Um, don't want to tip your hat or tip your hand to, you know, uh, testing. And like, like Mike said, you definitely don't want um, attention from certain people or, uh, um, you know, threat activity groups, uh, if you can at all avoid it. So thank you for stating that. Um, thank you. Yeah, totally. And I, and I don't mean to try and uh, in, intimidate absolutely anyone trying to set up a purple team from looking at open source resources that might aggregate very sophisticated threats to test against your environment. That's why they are successful. That's why they're in the market. Um, I think uh, it's just helpful to interrogate those frameworks a little bit on whether they're just scraping samples from open source and delivering them against enterprise networks, or uh, if there's been a, a little bit of oversight into making sure that they have been re-engineered, the payload specifically re-engineered for a kind of safe deployment. It is definitely not a reasonable expectation to expect every enterprise to have a, a team reverse engineering sophisticated malware, hollowing it out, and then redirecting against enterprise environments. That is. Definitely, I believe, something that should be occupied by the vendor space in cybersecurity, and hopefully they all do very well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I do know, uh, I'm familiar with one platform. They do they do a really good job at ensuring that the payloads are, <laughs> like, uh, you know, enterprise safe, uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, an actual real attacker's payload. So definitely, um, Bet, bet your vendors, essentially. Bet the products, bet the open source stuff that you use, obviously. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and then the last kind of red team thing that's my personal favorite, always has been, I think it's probably everybody's favorite, is the traditional red team hoodie clad hacker contractors that are uh, either internal to an organization or uh, a contract team that have assembled toolkits of usually offsec and open source tooling, um, as well as uh, some custom tools that are kind of usually VBS or JS based. Um, it's rare to see fully extensible uh, payloads being deployed by red teams. I have seen that, but um, it's more so uh, kind of internal tooling that will be deployed on a host after the fact. Um, and that's fun. That's basically tracking a different actor group. Um, they have an established set of TTPs, registration tactics that they like to use, different commands they like to run on the host and different intrusion uh, vectors to use. Um, and from a blue team perspective, you get to throw up a, a new threat actor moniker for uh, a red team if you're able to attribute it to a specific organization or a specific contractor within a given region. Um, and it's always fun to be able to, on the blue team side, hopefully identify a red team across multiple customers, because then you know they're not internal to one organization. But um, yeah, that function is very similar to tracking sophisticated crimeware or uh, sophisticated APT activity, where 
they are humans and you just look for the fingerprints of the humans behind the keyboard uh, and what they're doing on your computer or your network or in email. And from there, you're kind of able to build a, a profile, which I've always found to be the most fun. Um, and I don't think that is a practice that'll ever go out of vogue. I think that's kind of the at the core of the purple team ethos is red teams that are very good at what they do. Yes, well said, Mike. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's the rundown of what I've kind of seen top to bottom and how I would conceive of Purple Team in an enterprise environment. Uh, definitely make sure you plan well and that you report well. Uh, communicate with your vendors and your blue team uh, so that you can document that return on investments and uh, keep an eye out for those emulation frameworks that they're, they're kind of tooled up in the right way. But um, yeah, happy to help in any other way that I can. I'm, I'm sure I have more ideas on Purple Team, but um, from the enterprise vendor defense standpoint, I think that would be my current state of Purple Team. All right, thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate your time and expertise and having this fireside minus the fire chat um, about Purple Teaming. I really, really appreciate it and I value your insights. Yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I value the research you're doing. Really excited to see all those resources together and super excited to see the, the final dissertation when it comes together. So thank you for the initiative in doing that sort of academic research. It helps everyone in the field and I'm excited to see it. Oh, thank you.